again, we acknowledge your presence here. We're thankful for it. We're thankful for you. Thank you for meeting with us, Jesus. Thank you for saving us. We praise you for being included in your family. And we look to you now for guidance from your word. And uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak to us. Amen. Okay, and another fun thing, Dallas MCG, we're going to stuff Easter eggs for this weekend. So in addition to all the normal stuff we do. So come ready. Um, So Joseph. We've been talking about Joseph, right? And where we left off in the story of Joseph, he'd gone from 13 years a slave to viceroy, second in command, vice president, essentially, of Egypt. Um, Wow, lots happened with Joseph, right? And the larger story arc of Genesis, We've seen the chosen family, right? It started with Abraham. So if we think about kind of the purpose of Genesis as a whole, as a book, remember it's a book. We've seen the chosen family, Abraham, Isaac, now Jacob, and his family are threatened by famine. famine. And the promise that God has made has kind of a bleak outlook right now. There's famine in the land. They're not sure they're going to survive. With, with us, famine is less of a big deal in the industrialized Western world, but there's still nations today where you have a famine. It's a serious issue. People are going to die. Um, and so that's where we were with the large story arc of the chosen family. And now with the smaller story, Joseph, our protagonist, we left him at the Viceroy of Egypt. There were seven years of plenty. That's where we ended last time. So they stored up all the grain, just like Joseph said. Seven years of plenty, now there's a famine. And people all over the region are flocking to Egypt, not just Egyptians, but everywhere in Israel, Palestine, Syria. All these people are coming to Egypt for food. And now we're going to see these two stories woven together. Remember, we've been paying attention to Joseph's life by himself. But now the famine is going to drive his brothers right back into his life. Um, And when they do, when his brothers show back up, it's going to dredge up all the pain and anger he's been trying to forget. Remember when he named one of his sons Manasseh? Because God has caused me to forget the pain that I went through. Joseph faces with his brothers coming, what is probably, I think, his greatest test in his entire life, how to deal with these people who betrayed him. And we're going to see a series of exchanges between Joseph and his brothers. And although it could come across this way, they're not meant to be vindictive. I just wanted to say this up front. But rather a way for Joseph to test them. They're also a way for Joseph to get information. Since he can't just be like, hey, how's Benjamin? Or hey, how's dad? If he wants to maintain his anonymity, he can't just ask that. Specifically, he wants to see if they've changed, if his brothers have changed since the last time he saw them fading into the horizon while he was in chains on a caravan bound for Egypt. Thirteen years he hasn't seen them. He wants to see who they are now before they realize who he is. Because once they do, naturally they grovel and beg for forgiveness, even if it's completely insincere. Joseph has a privileged place of knowing everything in the exchange between them. While, while they, his brothers, the gang of ten, they'll be in the dark. And he's going to see how they act. So open your Bibles to Genesis 42. You can follow along. We're going to go through chapters 42 and 43 this morning. <coughs> and it starts off with this. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, why are you staring at one another? Jacob's a little snarky sometimes. He said, Behold, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us at that place so that we may live and not die. Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. Wonder who's missing. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I'm afraid that harm may befall him. So this is Jacob's favoritism coming right back into play. You guys, I don't really care what happens to you, but God forbid I send Benjamin. Seriously, imagine how that would feel. Gee, thanks, Dad, for caring about us. This is part of the dysfunction of Jacob's family. It's why Joseph's brothers were jealous of him in the first place. It makes sense in light of Jacob's favoritism. Now Benjamin has replaced Joseph because he thinks he's dead. Jacob thinks Joseph's dead. Benjamin has replaced Joseph as the new favorite son of his favorite wife, Rachel. Remember? The whole battle between Leah and Rachel over Jacob's attention. Now Rachel's children also have the pride of place. So the sons of Israel, verse 5, came to buy grain 
among those who were coming. So there's this stream of people, and we see the gang of ten just kind of follow that stream of people going to Egypt. For the famine was in the land of Canaan also, widespread. As far as they knew, it was worldwide. I mean, imagine that. As far as we know, there's famine. Big deal. Now, Joseph was the ruler over the land. So this is the dynamic that's about to be created. And he was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their noses to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. I mean, I imagine there's a flood of emotions that are conflicting right now for Joseph as he unexpectedly wakes up this morning and sees his ten brothers who almost killed him. And then they bow to the ground, and all of a sudden dreams are coming back to his mind that got him in trouble in chapter 37 in the first place. He spoke to them harshly, and he said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. Joseph has recognized his brothers, but they had not recognized him. Okay, disguise worked. And it's not that he just like donned a bunch of new clothing, but he didn't just like act like he recognized them. He was distant right? They had not recognized him. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had had about them, and he said to them, you are spies. It's interesting. You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Now, being accused of being a spy by a government official in Egypt is a very serious thing. It's a very serious thing. It meant one of two things. I mean, picture, you know, an American in Russia being accused of being a spy. Right? There were really only two outcomes. It either meant slavery or death. So they're freaked out. And it's ironic. It's ironic because that is the same fate that they had contend- condemned Joseph to back in chapter 37. First they wanted to kill him, then they decided to enslave him. Now those two prospects are staring the gang of ten in the face. Where have you come from? You are spies. You've come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Then they said to him, they're freaked out. No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. It's an ironic statement since we know their dirty little secret. We're honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, no, you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. And they they retort back, your servants are 12 brothers in all. See how they just immediately start volunteering information? I think this is part of why Joseph is doing this. The sons of one man, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Okay, so Joseph has extracted some information. He knows his father and Benjamin are doing well. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place until your youngest brother comes here. Until, unless your youngest brother comes here. So favoritism. Joseph and Benjamin, fav- sons of the favorite sons of the favorite wife. Joseph probably not only wants to see his brother, but also to see if they're lying and have done something awful to him as well. But from the brother's perspective, we know that that's the one son that they just can't bring. Remember Jacob said at the beginning, no harm can befall Benjamin. So the plot thickens. You have to bring the youngest brother here, and they're like, what are we supposed to do? Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies and will probably be killed. So he put them all together in prison for three days. Three days. Imagine what's going on through Joseph's head right now. He is now not only the master of his own fate, quite opposite of his years of enslavement, but now also his brothers. His brothers who betrayed him, who sold him into slavery, which was a slow death sentence, abandoned him, to a foreign country to rot. Joseph is staring them in the face with the authority to do whatever he wants with them. 
Can you imagine being in her shoes, having that decision to make? He could throw them in prison for the rest of their lives. He could enslave them as he had been. He could have them killed. And for three days, they sit in prison, and Joseph wrestles with himself and his pain and 13 traumatic years that he tried to forget while his brothers wait in fear in prison. And I imagine that more than once he thought about his own waiting in fear at the bottom of the pit as his brothers decided whether to kill him or sell him off, all out of jealousy and hatred. I imagine he thought that he should give them what they deserved, the same thing that they did to him. Three days, Joseph thinks about it. And those three days of thinking leave him with this. No, I fear God. Look at what he says in, verses 18, in verse 18. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your, in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go. Carry the grain for the famine of your households. In other words, don't let them starve to death. And bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they did so. And they did so. He makes a decision right there and refuses to succumb to the natural impulses he has to harm them, which anybody would feel. Anybody would feel. Something greater happened to Joseph than, oh, that's the way of the world. Something bigger than that is governing his decision. It's God. God governs Joseph. He refuses to let his pain outweigh God's Joseph. He tells his brothers, I fear God. I fear God. Joseph refuses to exercise that same vindictive streak that had left him always holding the short end of the stick. His brother's betrayal was just the beginning. The lies and false accusations of Potiphar's wife, forgotten by the cupbearer when he had a way out of rotting in prison. This system of broken relationships had dominated his life, the lives of his brothers, the life of his father. You see it in the generations of his family. Lying, stealing, cheating, favoritism. Joseph had been the brunt of all of that. And yet here we see him refuse to adopt it. And instead he recalls God. He refuses to exercise his authority to cause harm and be vindictive. He's on the receiving end of injustice all his life and he doesn't succumb to it and begin to deal it out himself. Three days he wrestled with the decision. Agonizing over what he felt versus what was right. And he came out with, no, I fear God. I fear God. Verse 18. Now Joseph said to them, oh, I'm sorry, verse 24. Then they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother. This is how this hits them. Truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them. He goes on. Did I not tell you, don't sin against the boy? He's the eldest, remember, but they didn't listen to him. Don't sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. He's probably forgotten a lot of the Hebrew. 13 years in another country, he's been speaking Egyptian his whole life, or his whole adult life now. There was an interpreter, so he understood. And he turned away and wept. And he wept. When Joseph named his children, he gladly chose the name Manasseh to commemorate his choice to forget what had happened to him. All the pain in his life. He said, this is what he says back in chapter uh, 41. God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's house. And so he did. And so he did. But now seven years later, with little Manasseh old enough to be running around the house, that forgotten memory and pain burst to the surface. 
bursts to the surface. The scab is forcefully reopened. There stand his brothers right in front of him, detailing, they didn't know he could understand them, detailing how they betrayed Joseph. We saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. We saw his agony and we didn't care. I would burst into tears too. Imagine the, psycholog the psychological trauma Joseph relives as his brothers bring up what they did to him right in front of him. The pain that would stir up, betrayed by his brothers, a slave for 13 years. But I think even more, he turns and weeps because this is also the first time he's heard that anyone stuck up, stuck up for him. Reuben, unsuccessfully. All those years of betrayal, being forgotten, loneliness, abandonment. Years he's had to dwell on this stuff. And he hears for the first time that one of his brothers tried to stop it. He weeps. And what the brothers say gives us their perspective. This is how this hits them. We see the debilitating effect of guilt. Guilt. It's clearly illustrated in these stories. Every time the brothers face a crisis, and we're going to see this continue on, it's not faith that comes into play, but guilt. Guilt destroys their ability to face life's crises positively, and they helplessly wallow in feelings of self-pity and regret. Self-pity and regret. We'll see their paranoia only gets worse. Remember the basic theology of that day? Tit for tat. Good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. Same as Job. They think their sins are finally catching up with them. Joseph brings up his fear of God when he decides to be merciful, and the brothers are thinking about God, but the brothers were thinking about God those three days in prison too, but only a fear of punishment. And now we'll see that fear govern them. Joseph wept. But when he returns... Verse 24, but when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. I imagine he picked Simeon because he's the second born. He had heard Reuben, the firstborn, stick up for him. So he's like, Simeon, you're next in line. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. And thus it was done for them. So Joseph, though conflicted, though surely in a great amount of pain, is ensuring his family's survival and well-being. He doesn't need their money. <laughs> and so he refuses, and, he, and by so doing, he refuses to succumb to revenge. I fear God. Take grain. Keep your money. It'll be interesting to see how the brothers react to that money. So they loaded their donkeys, verse 26, with their grain, and they departed from there. As one of them opened his sack, to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, okay, time to feed the animals, he saw his money, and behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. Then he said to his brothers, my money has been returned, and look, it's in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? More paranoia, more guilt. They think they're being judged, that God is toying with them, following them around to slowly punish them through fear and circumstance. Guilt is debilitating. Everything that will unfold from the brother's perspective will be like 1,000% charged with their feelings of guilt and fear of being judged. So they get back to Canaan. And when they, come, when they came to their father Jacob in the land, verse 29 of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke harshly with us. He took us for spies. We said to him, No, we're not spies. We're 12 brothers, son of one father. They recount the whole thing. The man, the Lord of the land, said to us, and this is the important thing, by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go, but bring your youngest brother to me that I may know that you are not spies but honest men. I will give your brother to you and you may trade in the land. That's not news that they want to break to Jacob. And they probably leave out the whole bit about, oh, and we were in prison for three days so that Jacob isn't even more anxious than he already is about his favorite son. They're going to have to pitch it perfectly if they want to convince him to let them take his favorite son with them to Egypt and put him in harm's way. 
It's ironic he's already in harm's way because of the famine, but Jacob doesn't see that. So verse 35, we don't get Jacob's response yet. Now it came about as they were emptying their sacks that behold, every man's bundle of money, one was bad, ten is worse, was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed. Their father Jacob said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more and you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Gee, thanks, Dad. Maybe we're your children, too. Once again. Then Reuben spoke to his father. So Reuben sticks up. Remember, they've got to pitch this because they want to get Simeon back, and they know they need food. They've got to get Simeon back. Reuben spoke to his father, saying, You may put my two sons to death if I don't bring him back to you, to put him in my care, put him in my care and I will return him to you. Reuben swings for the fences and completely whiffs. Great idea, Reuben. If he loses his favorite son, he can kill two of his grandkids. That'll make up for it. Reuben's trying to do his job as the firstborn, and we always see him screwing it up, dropping the ball. Tried to save Joseph. Didn't happen. Tries to convince him to take Benjamin. Yeah, great idea. Kill my kids. Right? But Jacob said, and Jacob's not convinced or amused. I don't know. Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he alone is left. Imagine hearing that. As the brothers, he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you're taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to shell in sorrow. It was where the dead lived in their mind. So we got more favoritism. Jacob is willing to sacrifice Reuben. I'm sorry, Simeon. Jacob is willing to sacrifice Simeon who is in prison in Egypt, instead of even entertaining the possibility that anything bad happened to Benjamin. His favoritism outweighs the needs of the family, and his fear of losing Benjamin, I think this is important, overshadows the promise of blessing that God made to him. Right? You'll have a land. You'll be a nation. I will bless you. And Jacob has lost sight of everything in his grief, over Joseph, and now his fear over Benjamin, his favorite sons of his favorite wife. You see the dysfunction that's governing this family. So what's going to happen? Genesis 43.1. Now the famine was severe. The famine was severe. Jacob was hoping to hold out, I think. Not have to worry about going back to Egypt for Simeon. But the famine was severe. So it came about that when they had finished eating the grain they had bought, that their father said to them, go back and get some food. Ignoring the whole issue. (laughs) We need more food. Judah spoke to him. So enter Judah onto the scene. Judah's the fourth oldest brother. There's Reuben, Simeon and Levi, and then Judah. Judah spoke to him, however, saying, the man solemnly warned us, solemnly warned us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. Notice how Judah takes ownership of his relationship with Benjamin. Despite the fact that his father's, despite the fact that his father's favoring Benjamin means that he is largely indifferent towards Judah. Jacob doesn't really care as much about the other brothers as he does Benjamin. And Judah still says, our brother. Judah doesn't take the cynical tone, your son. It's not, Benjamin is one of us in Judah's mind. He continues, but if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you're not going to see my face unless your brother's with you. You're not going to see my face unless your brother's with you. So then Jacob, Israel, it says here, then Israel said, why did you treat me so badly by telling the man whether you still had another brother? Jacob matches Judah's insistence with more veiled favoritism. Simeon is rotting in prison, and Jacob can't get over the fact that they endangered Benjamin by mentioning that he exists. It's amazing how distraught he is. But they said, the man questioned particularly about us and our relatives, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? So we answered his questions. Could we possibly know? Could we possibly know that he would say, bring your other brother down? You can hear the pain in their voices 
as they defend themselves. Could we possibly know that your favorite son, but here we are, <laughs> right? Judah said to his father Israel, send the lad with me. Let's see what Judah does. Send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. We as well as our little ones. Judah gets down to brass tacks. We're dying, dad. We're going to die. And this is what he says. I myself will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame before you forever. I will vouch for his safety personally. Reuben's like, you can kill my kids. Judah's like, I will personally vouch for Benjamin. Judah, and we're going to see a lot more about this next week. Judah has gone from come, let's sell our, bro our brother Joseph to the Ishmaelites in chapter 37. It was his idea, the favorite son, the son who we hate, the son we're jealous of. He's gone from let's sell him to putting his life on the line for the other favorite son. Maybe there has been a change of heart in the ranks of the gang of 10. Okay, you have our attention, Judah. For verse 10, for if we had not delayed, surely by now we would have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bags, carry them down as a present, get balm, honey, aromatic gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, almonds, take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. So Jacob still remembers that like, they had money, and they shouldn't have. And as far as they're concerned, Egypt thinks that they stole from them. And Jacob's like, take double the money, take gifts. We can't screw this up because my son, my favorite son, Benjamin, is coming. Take your brother also, Jacob concedes. Take your brother also and arise, return to the man. And may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man. Jacob is obviously concerned about Benjamin. He didn't say that to the brothers the first time they went so that he will release you, so that he will release to you your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Again, he will release to you your other brother, doesn't even give him a name, and Benjamin. And as far as Jacob is concerned, by letting Benjamin leave the tent, all of a sudden Benjamin's in prison with Simeon. Go get your other brother and be sure and bring this one back to me. So the men took this present, and they took double the money. They did all the stuff that he said, and they rose and went down to Egypt, and here we are, back before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his house steward, bring the men into the house and slay an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. This is unexpected. Here's my brothers, and here's Benjamin. Here's Benjamin, my full brother. Remember, only Joseph and Benjamin were sons of Rachel. Everybody else was a son of Leah. We're going to have a feast. So the man did as Joseph said, and he brought the men into Joseph's house. Now, as we walk into the house, as the gang of ten, we have not been informed of a banquet. We don't know what's going on, right? They don't know. We don't. They don't know. And what do you think their response was? Fear. More fear. The men were afraid, verse 18, because they were brought into Joseph's house. And so we get more paranoia. And they said, it is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time that we we're being brought in that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take, for, and take us for slaves with our donkeys. So there's more paranoia, more being governed by guilt in the gang of 10, plus Benjamin now. Remember, they're afraid that God is paying them back for what they've done. That's what they said earlier. They're anxious all the time about how God might pay them back when he might exact vengeance for their betrayal. They betrayed, and now they're expecting the Egyptians to betray them. They betrayed, and now they're expecting the Egyptians to betray them. But when we step back from what they're saying and just look at it, isn't it ridiculous? I mean, they're this ragtag group of backcountry redneck shepherds from a politically insignificant area all in all considered dirty and even despicable to the Egyptians. That's how they viewed them. And they're standing in front of the viceroy, the number two 
of one of the greatest empires on the planet at the time. And they're like, he wants our donkeys. It's absurd. He's going to steal our donkeys. But this is where they are emotionally. They're very nervous. They're ridden with guilt. They're frightened, and they love their donkeys. And that's the place this overriding guilt takes them to. This is where their guilt is just coloring everything that they see. Covering everything that they see. So they came near to Joseph's house steward, the guy who's setting up the feast, and they spoke to him at the entrance of the house. And they're trying to preempt this, right? They think they're about to be ambushed. And they're trying to preempt this. They say, oh, my Lord, indeed, we came down the first time to buy food, and it, and it came about, you know, we, were, we opened the sacks, we're feeding our donkeys, and look, there's the silver. We didn't know where it came from. So we have brought it back. We have brought double the money to buy more food, and we, and we don't know who put the money in our sacks. And they just, they're just kind of trying to give this quick explanation. of Like, please don't kill us, right? And listen to what this guy says. It's, it's, it's amazing. The steward says, be at ease. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. That has got to mess with them. They're expecting God's judgment. They're expecting God's judgment. And on the mouth of an Egyptian pagan steward, they hear, oh, your God is blessing you. So then he brought Simeon out to them. Simeon's well. Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and washed their feet, and they fed their donkeys. Okay, they don't want our donkeys. So they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon because they heard there was going to be a meal. So they're like, all right, let's put the food together. We still got to impress this guy because we're afraid. We are terribly afraid that God is going to judge us through him. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house with him the present that was in their hand and second time bowed to the ground before him. Then he asked them about their welfare. And he said, is your old father well? Is he still alive? He desperately wants to say, how's dad? But he can't. They said, your servant, our father is well. He is still alive. They bowed down in homage. Third time. Third time. As he lifted his eyes and saw his, brother's, his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, may God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother, and he sought a place to weep. Second time now. Breaks down in tears. And he entered his chamber and wept there. He's reunited with his brother after 13 years of thinking he'll never see him again. The only brother who had never betrayed him. His mother's son, his only full brother. Imagine what he's feeling. He'd probably been wondering if they'd harmed him too. So then Joseph hurries out, cleans himself up. You can picture, I imagine a few of us have broken down in bathrooms in public places before. You've got to try and make it look like you didn't cry. <laughs> That's what Joseph did, did. He washed his face and he came out and he controlled himself because he couldn't. And he said, serve the meal. So they served him by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. They, remember, these guys are despicable, really, these shepherd people from, from uh, Israel. Now they were seated before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in astonishment. That, again, that would really mess with you. It's like, he doesn't know. <laughs> How could he know this? The gang of ten is confused. He took portions to them from his own table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. <laughs> Stack of food, right? <laughs> five times. And this doesn't have to be Joseph's favoritism with his brother. As much as it is, I think this is more to the point, he's marking out his brother amongst the rest in preparation for his next and final test. And that'll be two weeks from now after Easter. But they're going to notice the extra food just like they noticed Joseph's nice tunic back in chapter 37. The favorite son, the new favorite son, extra food. Joseph's setting them up to try and betray Benjamin. He wants to see if they've changed. He wants to see if they've changed. Will they turn on him? We'll see. And this is where we have to leave Joseph for now. Feasting 
and drinking with the same brothers who betrayed him. Well, they have no idea who he is. Sitting across the table from each other, you could cut the tension with a knife. And this part of the story is really only half over. There's another series of tests coming up before the final resolution of the plot. So in some ways, it's an awkward place to stop. But we don't have another hour. <laughs> but even halfway through this portion of the story, there is something incredible that we've seen so far in Joseph's interaction with his brothers. Something incredible. He went from try and forget the pain to being blasted with it in the course of a few minutes. And in that incredibly painful, vulnerable moment, he found himself completely in control in the situation. He was in charge, he was the master, and he could do whatever he wanted with them. They tried to kill him, he could kill them back. They sold him as a slave, he could enslave them. It's the fantasy of victims to be put in control of their abusers. Why? Because when you're abused, like Joseph was, you're bereft of power, you're powerless, you are made powerless, and you're helpless. We dream of being able to punish those who made us feel that way. We want to be in control. And there is Joseph, square in the middle of that paradigm, and now he's the one in charge. He actually is the one in charge. He has power over them and 13 years of trauma to go with it. He commanded all of Egypt. He commanded all of Egypt. And yet, he refused. Remember those three days. He refused to use his position of power to punish them. Think about the dynamic that is up there on the page, the details. How many times his brother bowed to him in the course of these interactions? Three times. Three times, they bowed before Joseph and they stuck literally, usually transla translations say faces, literally their noses to the dirt. Their noses to the dirt. He had the authority, but instead of stomping their noses even further in the dirt, he was more concerned that his family be fed and that his brother Benjamin and father were alive and well. He was still hurting. The tears streaming down his face proved that. He was still hurting, but he wasn't vindictive. And by refusing to cave, and this is what I'm getting at, by refusing to cave to that system of betray, be betrayed, hurt, be hurt, enslaved, be enslaved, tit for tat, that system of revenge, instead of that, Joseph stands in the gap of generations of familial sins in his family. Generations. It wasn't just his brothers. I mean, what have we encountered so far in the story? Okay, betrayal. Jacob did it on multiple occasions. Joseph's brothers did it to him. I mean, it goes back to Cain killing Abel. And out of what? Jealousy. Again, same as Joseph's brothers. Manipulation, lying, vindictiveness, favoritism, rash action, being indecisive and weak. Abraham, for instance. The list could go on in this family, this family that God chose, right? How dysfunctional they were. Genesis is far from an epic tale of a blameless chosen family. For, generation, for generations, they were riddled with these problems. And if there were ever a time where he could cave and be like them, it was then. It was when his brother's noses are in the dirt and he's vindicated and he was right and they're afraid. He could have wielded that fear, but he didn't. He resolved to say, yes, I will be on the receiving end of all this crap. I will endure it but I refuse to perpetuate it. I will endure it, but I refuse to perpetuate it. Joseph stops the system. It stops with me. I fear God, he says, and then he feasts with them. We can all think of ways when we're tempted to use the same dysfunctional means of manipulation that people and family members use on us. There's this inherent framework built into the relational fabric of families and society in general that we tend to perpetuate the dysfunction of our families and those who are close to us. My parents did this to me, or this was the system in our family, and so it's what I do, even if it's subconscious. We don't all decide to do this. Criticism, bursts of anger, passive aggression, 
being hypercritical, addictions, being manipulative with speech, belittling others to make yourself look good. I could list dozens and dozens and dozens of things that perpetuate themselves through the relational fabric that we live in. Dysfunctional ways that we, that we get what we want or hurt people and manipulate situations. Wielding those, this is the thing, wielding those same things that other people wielded over us, right? Wielding those same things that other people wielded over us. We want to become the ones who are in the powerful position. I mean, on the extreme end, did you know that 35%, 35% of male sexual abusers were themselves sexually abused? 35%. For some reason, it's built into our psyche. These destructive dynamics perpetuate themselves through us. And it becomes the norm. Joseph could have yielded to that reality like his brothers did. Remember, they betrayed and expected betrayal. But he didn't. Joseph stood in the gap of generations of dysfunction. He didn't wield that power that his brothers had so horrifically wielded over him. It stopped with him. And we can look at our own dysfunctions. The time the times when we choose to wield manipulation over mercy, strong arming over humility, passive aggression over honesty and vulnerability, or whatever else is coming to your mind as you reflect on your life and your family and your friends and your romantic interests, girl, girlfriends, boyfriends, husbands, wife, yeah, bad show of laughter right now. You can think about those dynamics and it can stop with us too. It can stop with us too we can be the end of the vicious cycle of relational breakdown. In fact, Jesus empowers us to do it. Loving our enemies, which sounds like a trope, but imagine that. Honoring our parents, seeking peace instead of power, peace instead of self-justification, ultimately embracing, not with lip service, but with our very lives, that kingdom of God that Jesus described, living out the kingdom of God. And that is what we're supposed to be as a church. The kingdom is in you, Jesus said. Us as a church, us as families, this is where it happens. We don't have to submit to the system of be abused and abuse, be manipulated, manipulate. We don't have to say that's just the way it works. Joseph could have said that a hundred times in his life, but he didn't. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed, the new has come. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we have freedom in Jesus. We are liberated, liberated from that system into God's glorious kingdom. We're moving now into a time where we remember the death of Jesus symbolically through communion. And just, consider this, just as he put to death all our sin on the cross when he died, consider the dysfunction that's governed your life or your family's life and how you can nail that to the cross too and be rid of it. Consider how Jesus in a way made a bigger decision than even Joseph, choosing mercy, not judgment, choosing to bear the brunt of all the dysfunction, all the hatred, all the lies, How do they put it in the New Testament? Sin itself. He bore sin itself to the cross for the sake of those that had hated him. Joseph, we leave him dining with his brothers. Jesus took to the cross all that for the sake of those who hated him for our sake. And as we say, it stops with me. It stops with me. We don't have to bear that burden alone. We can see our Savior bearing that same burden and walk with him as he strengthens us.